So I will just quickly start up and then I will hand over to you. I would like to welcome everybody this evening in China or this morning if you're in Europe or at any other time of the day, depending on where you are calling into this event. My name is Gabor Holsch and I am the convener of the Royal Asiatic Society China History Club, where we are very happy to welcome back Paul French, who has actually been with us twice before, but he never runs out of ideas that are worth presenting here. I think that to most of you, I don't need to introduce the Royal Asiatic Society China anymore. If um, you would like me to do so, then we can use a little bit of time at the end in the Q&A, but you probably know that we are passionate about spreading ideas and inviting speakers regarding anything China and Asia. And we have a couple of different types of events. The History Club is one of them, but we also have uh, arts, urbanism, fiction and nonfiction books. And then we have a um, um, lovely collection of events uh, called Stories of Things. So if you are in Shanghai, I think um, it is a, a great place to hang out and uh, discuss China <laughs> and Asia issues with like-minded people. But increasingly, we are also there wherever you are with the internet because uh, quite a few of our events went online. And also, at the end of last year, we started a YouTube channel where you can uh, see quite a few of our events now, including, uh, as far as I remember, at least one of uh, Paul's previous appearances at the History Club. So <clears throat> I also think that um, those of you who are here already know uh, Paul French, but I will just say a couple of words about well, out of the many things that he does, the one that is most relevant to us is, is authorship. So just mentioning the books that I personally uh, read and reread every now and then um, are the ones uh, Destination Peking, Destination Shanghai, Midnight in Peking, City of Devils. Then there is the uh, Bloody Saturday that I think came out very recently as a, as a new edition, second edition. Do I remember that correctly, Paul? Yes. Um, some of the books I think are quite addictive for the, for the very reason that this talk and Paul's essay in the 2021 Royal Asiatic Society uh, China Journal is so immersive, is that they give us a three-dimensional picture of China or the part of China in question in, in, in using all of the senses that we can imagine. So it's not only about events, it's not only about characters and people and the big picture, but it's also streets, encounters, smells, noises, what people bought, what people were worried about, how they paid their taxes and everything else. It is, it is always a fascinating journey and I'm very much looking forward to introducing Pulp Fiction and 1950s Shanghai today. Thanks, Gabor. Thanks, everyone. Sorry, my personal camera seems to be on the blink. So um, <clears throat> I'm afraid you're just going to see an advert for a BBC radio podcast that you can still download wherever you get good podcasts if you're interested in Peking history. Um, I'm going to talk, though, about Pulp Fiction. I, I, I've always read Pulp Fiction and Shanghai you know, sort of as a kid was always part of that Pulp Fiction. It pops up everywhere. <clears throat> and then in lots of later work that I've done, I've sort of taken lots of elements of Pulp Fiction in terms of storytelling. Um, and, and also then, of course, thought about, so when you read all this Pulp Fiction, and that's particularly the stuff about China, and especially the stuff about Shanghai, um, how much of it is real? How much is it just someone sitting in a room somewhere in the middle of America writing something and how much is it someone who's writing from experience. And so trying to research back on some of the writers of Pulp Fiction is sort of um, uh, quite interesting. And I think the, there's a lot of Pulp Fiction on, on Shanghai and China, and I'll, I'll run through the history of it a little bit, but really that that comes in the 1950s is, is really the stuff that I think is the best and the most interesting. And also because it gives us... Um, an insight into what is normally called kind of interregnum Shanghai, uh, 
So, of course, there's a there's a revolution in 1949. Uh, well, the, really, at the end of the Second World War, we have that strange period of the Civil War um, with everyone trying to deal with displaced persons in Shanghai and war raging around Shanghai, civil war. And then, of course, the revolution in 1949. And then everything doesn't change overnight. There's still sort of in the early 1950s, you know, there's still gangsters, there's still opium dens, there's still sailor bars, there's still uh, white Russians, but they're now called displaced persons under the new UN classifications. There's still refugee Jews, and those people are trying to find new homes and new countries to go to. Um, there's big decisions having to be made by Chinese people who, of course, can still leave at that point. The ships are still coming to Shanghai. It's still a major trading point. And as you can see from this picture, and I have some more pictures of uh, Vladislav um, uh, Mikosha, who was a, a Russian who was there at the time, um, he uh, 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 took these pictures, which, of course, were taken in color and are taken in 1950 and are that kind of interregnum you'll spot exactly where the locations are the the interregnum type so you'll still see lots of advertising hoardings up shop signage uh, business going on um but at the same time you've got this slow infiltration as you can see in banners and so on of of the communist uh, party and the communist era so so the kind of books that were written at the time are quite interesting as well because we don't have a massive foreign press corps there at the time. And the newspapers of the Shanghai, North China Daily News, uh, China Weekly Review, China Press, are either going out of business, about to go out of business, or really have slimmed <clears throat> right down and aren't able to report quite as freely as before. Foreign journalists were getting quite a lot of hassle. Most were leaving, starting to go to Hong Kong, um, not, not hanging around in, in the new sort of communist China. So, so this is the kind of Shanghai that, that some people then decide to write about. It's still somewhere that's seen as a thrilling adventure. It's not yet somewhere. Um, and in the later 1950s and the 1960s and 70s, of course, we start to see Shanghai and China drop out of Pulp Fiction because it's just not somewhere you can feasibly visit anymore. The bamboo curtain has fallen, so it doesn't happen. There's always been Pulp Fiction around China. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, we can go back to just pure sort of yellow peril, Sax Roma being the best example of that and the Fu Manchu books, just, you know, China bad, good Westerners, I mean, very unnuanced um, and, and, and really a different subject, but written in that kind of hectic, frantic sort of, sort of style. Um, there was a lot of serialization in newspapers, particularly in America. Um, the, these are two, two writers who did an awful lot of serialization and often included China and Shanghai. Um, Richard Finch and William Richards, um, they, the, the stories are worth reading. You can, if you have access to newspaper archives, you can sort of go back and, and, and download all of the, the different elements to put them together. They were often later published as books. Um, but these were obviously the newspaper's attempt to compete with all of the pulp fiction magazines that were coming out, particularly in America, selling at newsstands, and, and the newspapers were losing, losing their short story audience at that time. And you can see all the usual tropes are here, particularly where Shanghai is concerned. Uh, beautiful women, men in rickshaws, Europeanized settings, uh, uh, meetings between China and, and the West. Um, and they're all in that kind of hyperbolic uh, language, but but they're they're quite fun if you take them for what they are. Several writers of of, of sort of pulps started to really concentrate on on writing about people. Van Wyck Mason, who's not really read much anymore, but wrote an awful lot of books, had a, a hero, a sort of Captain Hugh North of G two U.S. Army military intelligence, who was a sort of early American style Bond kind of uh, character. Um, he does have sort of gadgets and things like that and runs around. He wrote several uh, books that were set in Shanghai, which he had visited. Um, this, this shows him cooking. It was the only photo I could find of him. Actually. Um, and um, uh, uh, one, the Shanghai Bund Murders is a, is a very good one, um, which starts with a boat arriving at, at the Bund and um, murders occurring. Um, it, it's a sort of a whodunit more than a, more than a pulp, but it kind of overlaps a little bit as it has this kind of all-American uh, hero running around defeating um, 
well, Ch Chinese triads, I think, in that book, if I remember rightly. I think there is a copy in the um, RAS library, if anyone uh, wants to read it. Um, he also uh, wrote a, short, a very good sort of novella called Shanghai Sanctuary, which you can get hold of, which is uh, also very interesting. So, so Shang I mean, what he did was establish that Shanghai in particular, as opposed to more of the yellow peril stuff, which often was about nefarious Chinese like Dr. Fu Manchu being in Europe or America. This is more about people going to China and to Shanghai. That was then developed with the kind of nice guy Chinese pulps, of which I think Charlie Chan is, is the best one. And um, of course, Earl De Biggers wrote the books until he died. And then, of course, Charlie Chan has his massive long history in B movies afterwards. Um, but again, picked up uh, by the newspapers. Um, and interestingly, um, after Earl De Biggers died, um, a serious literary writer, a, a writer of sort of Boston literary novels, John Marquand, uh, was asked by the Saturday Evening Post, which had first published the Charlie Chan stories, um, to come up with a hero. Um, and it was, I mean, newspapers were very different in those days. And he was actually told to just go away to Asia and spend some time there and come up with an idea. And so naturally he said, yes, please. And he went to Japan, but then he went to um, uh, China and he stayed for a long time in Beijing. Um, and in my uh, book, uh, Destination Peking, I have an essay about him there. He met his, his wife there, um, became obsessed with the, with the um, Forbidden City and so on. And he came up with the idea of Mr. Moto. Now, the argument I want to make about Mr. Moto very quickly, which I make at greater length in that piece, is that um, you really need to forget the old Peter Lorre movies, right? I mean, they are pretty awful. And the sort of buck teeth, silly Mr. Moto running around is, is really, and then, and then of course ended up working for some sort of international agency and becoming a sort of good Japanese at a time when America is falling out with Japan is sort of nonsense and nothing to do with the books. The books are really quite sophisticated pieces of writing. They're, they're, they're short and they're pulpy but they're done by someone who is a literary writer um, and that shows. And Moto is a kind of a background figure, rather like kind of Carla in, in, in the Le Carre uh, Smiley novels. Um, you know, we don't ever really see or hear much of, of, of Carla. He just pops up at various points. And Moto is like that in these books. They're mostly about other people. They're mostly set in China. Um, and Moto occasionally is in the background as a sort of puppet master, moving things around to the sort of nefarious ends of the Japanese empire in China, um, and, and is sort of being thwarted. So I would urge you, if you, if you sort of like reading pulp and, and like sitting around reading novels, which you can get through in a day or two, um, to go through and read the Moto series, um, because they, they, if, you, if you've only ever seen the films, they, they'll surprise you at how sophisticated um, they are with all the caveats, of course, of they are products of their time. And so, you know, like they do on Netflix and everywhere else now, you know, be aware there is racial stereotyping, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, they are not um, as dumb as the movies and worth looking at. And then, of course, there's this other great producer of Pulp Fiction on China, um, which you can now uh, buy, L. Ron Hubbard, who, of course, is much better known now for various things, and obviously the Church of Scientology. Um, I, I had no idea that L. Ron Hubbard had written um, anything about China or had any contact with China. And, and of course, um, not being particularly prone towards Scientology, had not actually really paid much attention, or science fiction either, actually, had not really paid much attention to L. Ron Hubbard. And I happened to be on a book tour in America and was in Dayton, Ohio, at a bookshop. And um, afterwards, a member of the Church of Scientology came up to me and said, and gave me a set of... Um, pulp fiction short stories by L. Ron Hubbard, which Galax, something called Galaxy Press, which I believe is a publishing house owned by the Church of Scientology, um, actually um, published. And um, most of them have sort of dragon in the title and they've given them very good pulpy uh, um, covers. You can get them as eBooks, actually, I noticed the other day on, um, on, on Amazon or elsewhere. Um, and, and I sort of, you know, stuck traveling around America in hotel rooms, um, I, I read them and I was sort of quite surprised as to um, how interesting they were, which prompted me to sort of look into L. Ron Hubbard's background to see what it was. And it's sort of quite interesting because there is the official L. Ron Hubbard story about everything, including a visit to China. 
and then there's the truth. So L. Ron Hubbard claims that he worked across the Far East on a tramp steamer moving between Japan and, and Java, um, and that he got to know Shanghai, he got to know Beijing, he got to know the Western Hills area around Beijing, that he went inland and um, tussled with Mongolian bandits, that he spent time with Tibetan shamans. Um, and he claims to have met a character called Major Ian McBean of, of the British Secret Service in China. Um, now, of course, many of us have pointed out to the Church of Scientology that no such character as Major Ian McBean actually exists, which, of course, as you might expect, they would reply, well, he was a British intelligence officer. So, of course, British intelligence would deny his existence. Right? And L. Ron Hubbard remembers him. But there does not seem to be any other anyone else who recalls Major Ian McBean, uh, with whom um, Ron, L. Ron Hubbard claimed to have fought Cantonese pirates at some point. The truth of the story is rather less prosaic. Um, in 1927, he, he did sail to Guam um, with his mother, with his mum. He went with his mum. Um, his father was stationed at the US Naval base on Guam, and he did transfer ships in Shanghai, so had a bit of a day trip. In 1928, he revisited his dad, and he did take a side trip, as many people did when, when boats went through Tianjin um, to Peking with his parents and did do a trip to the Great Wall. So he did go to China, and he did have a look around, and he was obviously interested in what was going on there. Um, and most of his uh, books, uh, uh, most of his pulps are usually set around the sort of time of the Japanese occupation of Manchuria, the annexation of Manchuria and the creation of Manchukuo. And he actually, he has all the sort of usual things that you'd expect. He has white Russian femme fatales. He has Soviet spies, British intelligence guys running around, brave Americans, of course, triumphing over everyone. Um, Soviet interference, Japanese interference in, in China. Um, and most of his history is actually pretty good. Um, and, and he gets a lot of that right. So um, if you like reading a bit of pulp and Elrond Hubbard intrigues you, um, he is there if you want to have a look at him. Anyway, let's come on to China Coaster, which I really think is worth a read. Um, because it, when I read it initially, I was sort of quite surprised at how accurate some of the descriptions seem to, seem to be. Um, it's written by a man called Don Smith, um, who wrote any number of pulps that were published as books, but also in pulp magazines. And, and China Coast was published in this one called the, the Blue Book, Adventure in Fact and Fiction. Again, a newsstand title that would be sold all across America. Um, and you can see here, it's been given a, a rather dramatic uh, full color cover, looking through a porthole out at the uh, junks in, uh, in the China seas. So quite exciting if you're going to your dentist's appointment in Milwaukee or, or, or a rather boring office job in Cincinnati, you can see why you might stop and pick that up. No offense to Milwaukee and Cincinnati people that, that just popped into my head that, um, as not being somewhere with lots of junks seen through portholes. Um, and then the book comes out. Over the years, it has several um, uh, covers. Uh, mostly uh, quite uh, salacious um, and uh, uh, quite exciting. It's, um, I guess, the, the thing. The basic story is 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 a, a sort of a rolling, fast-moving pulp story about an all-American six-foot-three-inch hero called Michael O'Connor, um, who has kind of been knocking around China for a long time, and now that there's been this revolution, he's deciding to bail out and head back to, well, not to America necessarily, but down to Hong Kong. But he ends up being sort of uh, Shanghai'd. Uh, the boat is literally kidnapped and he is taken up to um, Qingdao, where he manages to escape. There's some machinations there and get back to, um, to Shanghai. And the Shanghai that Smith describes is, 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 is pretty interesting. Um, I mean, he mentions things that are going on at the time, um, which obviously you'd be able to see in the newspapers, uh, rampant inflation, uh, lots of shortages. I mean, he talks about something which um, uh, shortage of razor blades, which, which was a big issue in, in uh, Shanghai at the time. Um, 
people being stopped randomly for ID checks by uh, sort of communist officials, um, life, life just becoming a bit of a hassle. Um, but what he also talks about is the is the the Russian emigre community, the white Russian community, and the fact that they are now classified as displaced persons under the new um, under the new uh, uh, United Nations um, Refugee Resettlement Agency, um, which whose headquarters, by the way, were Embankment House, which I know you all know Embankment House. And this is a doorway at Embankment House when it was taken over by UNRWA after the war. And you could go there and you submitted your papers and you waited to see if you'd got a passport for another country. Um, and so he talks, he talks a lot about that. And he has a nice description at the start, which I'll read. Um, of course, Michael O'Connor is irresistible to the ladies, as all Pulp Fiction heroes should be. Um, and um, before uh, he sort of uh, left, decided to leave because of the changes in Shanghai, um, he's sort of broken up with a woman called Anya Chekhov, perhaps not an overly uh, imaginative Russian name to be dreamt up by a writer, Chekhov. But anyway, he says, he says here at the start of the chapter two of the book, Anya Chekhov met me at the North Station in Shanghai. I had sent her a wire from Tsingtao telling her what train to meet. And when I caught sight of that tall, beautiful Russian, I decided it was almost worth risking a return to Shanghai. So we're in good pulp territory there. But then he says, I'd known the girl for the past four or five years. Her father, a white Russian, had brought his family down from Harbin in the early 20s rather than live under the hammer and sickle. He and his wife had disappeared during the Japanese occupation and Anya was left to bring up herself and her young sister. She'd gone back to her old job as a taxi dancer at the Venus. She hated the Soviets, but strangely enough, they left her as they did the rest of the now tiny colony, col colony of white Russians in Shanghai strictly alone. And I think that's a nice sort of, of description and it shows a sort of an awareness of, of the changing situation, but also the, the slightly odd situation of the, um, the, the, the Russian emigres in, in Shanghai at that time. Um, he then goes on uh, uh, to talk about um, uh, Anya Chekhov and other white Russians who he sort of hides among, um, living on Wayside, which is of course Huoshanlu which you, many of you will know uh, over in Hong Kong, Tilan Chow um, was part of the Jewish ghetto, um, was under Japanese control. And of course, it was before that part of the, what was generally called the Japanese concession and the edge of what was also known as Little Tokyo over in that area. Huoshan Lu Wayside is very interesting. I mean, um, in the 1920s and into the 1930s, it's, it's, it's you know, the architecture there, it's Western style architecture. Um, it had been a very Russian area. It's always been a working class area and it had always been, it had been quite a Russian area. In fact, at one point, um, some of the Russians there were poor enough that a Russian entrepreneur bought up a load of um, disused uh, trolley buses, sort of tram cars that, that one of the tram companies in Shanghai was getting rid of. And he put them on a sort of a, laid them on a, if you see a sort of a lane here between two houses, he, he put them in sequence down the lane and, and rented them out as accommodation, um, specifically two Russians um, who could not afford rents on, on the sort of apartments that you see there on, on those pictures, which of course you're familiar with. So it was an area that traditionally had been quite poor. Um, Russians often ran bars, and restaurants along there. It was patrolled by the Shanghai Municipal Police Eastern District. Um, there was a police station nearby. Um, it was well known for uh, fights breaking out, uh, lots of drugs being sold, illegal, illegally brewed booze being sold. I mean, everything went on. It was a sort of a unique mixture of the white Russian emigres trying to make a living and, and that often being bars and restaurants, but often also prostitution and so on. But it was also, and it was an area that, that Shanghai landers went to, to sort of see, to slum it, if you like. Um, but it was also an area that um, visiting seamen, merchant seamen and, and Navy sailors would go to as well, knowing that they could get all the things that sailors ashore like to get and expect to get 
in, in Shanghai in the 1920s and 30s. Then, of course, in the late 1930s, it became um, very much uh, associated with Jewish refugees, and many of the businesses there, as you can see in that picture, were taken over by Jewish refugees. Then after the war, uh, was, then during the later years of the war, a lot of it was then taken over by Japanese, um, who sort of um, ran various bars and places. When they were kicked out, and they were all gone by kind of mid-1946, really, with repatriations, the Russians kind of moved back in. And so many, many of the flats and apartments above the shops and the shops below became bars, shops, restaurants, cafes, and so on for the Russians again. Um, it's obviously somewhere that, that Don Smith knew. Um, he writes, uh, we drove out to Wayside. The car turned in an alley and drew up behind one of the shabby old foreign built houses typical of that district. I paid off the driver and followed the girl in the back entrance and upstairs to a small room on the third floor. I closed the door, slid the bolt across and for the first time in two days, relaxed. The room faced the front of the house and I threw open the shutters to ease out the stench of cheap perfume. That's a very Pulp Fiction motif there, cheap perfume. It was overstuffed with rickety Honko furniture. The only solid looking piece was an enormous double bed, part of the necessary equipment I gathered of the successful Shanghai cabaret girl. Well, well, there we are, of course, uh, introducing sex as well as we can in the 1950s. Um, so Don Smith is writing about Wayside. He's brought in there that she's a dancer. She's, she's living there of slender means, um, and she's a dancer at the Venus, all interesting places. Um, just quickly to go back to Don Smith, I should explain that what after reading that and thinking about what he has to say, he also has many other parts of Shanghai that he just alludes to, but they're ones that any, anyone could have done at the time, you know, coming out of the Palace Hotel, looking at the Cafe Hotel, walking on the Bund. I mean, anyone who'd read a newspaper could do that. Um, Wayside is a little more tricky to do. He also has one section where he goes to uh, Minhung, um, and he describes Minhung in some detail. I'm not going to go into that because um, Minhung then and Minhung now are so awful that I'm not going to really mention them. Although maybe slightly better then, there was a sort of a yacht club out there. I think if, if they've still got the racket club out there, I seem to remember. But um, um, he does, so he just, you know, I don't think that, uh, we didn't know Shanghai, Minhung would hardly be somewhere that you'd sort of throw in into the mix. It's not really in the guidebooks. Um, so the truth was that, that Don Smith had indeed been a newspaper man in America and had um, spent time for various newspapers and wire services in Shanghai um, before the war. So he knew the pre-war Shanghai. Um, he then um, came to, he was born originally in Canada, moved to the United States, but came to England in the war where he was involved in um, the Royal Air Force. Um, and then after the war, really concentrated on being a, a pulp fiction writer. So what I think is happening here is that, of course, he's, he's remembering places like Wayside that he knew before the war. And he's kind of obviously up on what's going on in Shanghai. And so he's creating um, uh, in his head and, and on the page the, um, the, the, the places that he, that, that he can, um, you know, the, the post-war changes that have happened. Um, the Venus, of course, was, was a real uh, nightclub. If you've read my book, City of Devils, you know that it's in there quite a lot. And, and, and it was run by Sam Levy, who, who actually gets a, a sort of an acknowledgement in the book in the sense that it's mentioned of the kind of Jewish boss of the Venus Cafe. He ran it for an awful long time. And, and he ran it for a long time with a woman called Gergi Moalem, um, who I think was a second cousin or something of his. Um, and they ran it together and, until they had a slight falling out. When the, it, it was very, very successful. Um, it was on um, uh, North, North Sichuan Lu, as you can see here, up near the Isis Theatre, a real little centre of entertainment on the North Sichuan Road. Um, it, was, it had jazz. It stayed open very, very late. Um, it was a kind of a, um, a, a very popular place um, for, for, for people to go. You'd think it was slightly off the beaten track. It was not in the top tier of nightclubs, but probably was all the more fun for that. So it wasn't sort of Ciro's or the Canadrome or the Paramount, but it was it was it was a couple of notches down, and so therefore probably less snobby and more fun. Um, 
Gergi Moalem and Sam Levy fell out, I think, at some point before the Second World War. She married a British guy. So when the war came, she went with her husband into um, internment, one of the internment camps. Sam Levy stayed outside of um, internment. Um, he was technically an Iraqi Jew, um, and so he was not um, interned. Um, there's a picture of him here. This is this is the whole sort of family and clan that were around the Venus uh, Cafe. He's the sort of um, guy with the jacket and tie and slightly bald head in the, in the middle there. Um, Sam had an interest. In, he suffered quite a lot during the war. It was very tough. I mean, he, he spent his time around places like Wayside and, and North Sichuan Road and that, that part of, of, of the world. Um, and then eventually afterwards, because he had been a nightclub host, and this is the problem that Anya Chekhov in the book has as well, is when you went to the United Nations and you said, well, I, you know, I'd like, a, I'd like to go to America or I'd like to go to uh, Britain, which usually meant you were sent to Australia, um, or, or I'd like to go to somewhere else. Brazil, for instance, took in a lot of uh, Russians. Uh, <coughs> if you were um, considered by those countries from the records of the Shanghai Municipal Police or, or just anyone knowing this, to have a slightly dodgy past, you tended to get put to the end of the list. This is Anya Chekhov's uh, thing, because she is working as a taxi dancer and a cabaret girl, and it's alluded to sort of casual prostitution on Wayside, her chances of getting an American passport are tougher. Um, Sam suffered the same for being associated with a nightclub in which if you read City of Devils, you'll know many figures of sort of foreign organized crime in Shanghai uh, patronized. And so he went to the end of the list. And in the end, he did, uh, when, when it just became impossible in the uh, early 1950s to stay in Shanghai anymore, he eventually went to Palestine. Um, and um, eventually became a citizen of the state of Israel. Um, I, just before moving on, I want to um, uh, uh, talk about one other place, which I don't have a, a photo of, but it interests me very much. And this is, um, this is um, where he talks about, uh, oh, hang on, I've just, I've, I know, what, what's the name of the road? Um, Tian Tong Road now. Yes, no, and, and Nanshu Lu, which are both in, um, Tiantong is, is a big road, obviously, that runs through um, uh, uh, Hong Kong. And, and he has a lot of descriptions of the pawn shops along that road, which were catering off, often, of course, to Russian refugees and Jewish refugees as much as they were to the Chinese. I mean, he has a very good description of those. And that indeed was a street that was lined with pawn shops at that time. And he also talks about Nanshu Lu, which is a much smaller road, um, over in Hong Kong, which, which did become known for, um, it was sort of the last place in Shanghai in the interregnum period that had um, opium dens. And by that time, of course, um, other drugs coming in as well. And I think, you know, whenever people think of Shanghai or China, they think of a sort of classic opium den, really from a sort of yellow peril novel of Sax Roma that we were talking about before. But by this time in the um, interregnum, something different was going on, and he describes one. Um, and I think from from sort of other memoirs that I've that I've read about such places, you know, quite accurately, he says, um, uh, "Keeping to the lesser streets and alleys, I worked back to Hongku. I came in the end in the top end of Nanzing Road. The top end of Nanzing Road is now Nanshu Lu, and walked down until I found a Chinese asleep in a doorway. Anyway, boom, boom. He goes on. He gets in." The acrid stench that greeted me made the malodorous alleyways I had just traversed seem almost sweet by comparison. Through the thick smoke, I glanced down a long, narrow room. The floor was covered with human bodies, some in heavy, drugged slumber, the flies playing around their open mouths. Others, crouching head to head, were smoking opium or injecting heroin into their flesh with crude, homemade hypodermics. A meagre light was shed from the dozen or so candles shoved into bottlenecks and standing on low tables or boxes. These candles were not there for lighting purposes, although they had to serve. They were being used for cooking the, brown, the dark brown pellets of opium. And above the low hum of conversation, I could hear the sizzling and bubbling of the drug as it was prepared for the pipe. Now that, as, as someone who's obviously interested in low life endeavors in, in Shanghai, interests me greatly because it shows 
um, the, the widespread use of heroin in Shanghai at the time, which is something we do know was really happening. Now, this had started happening before the war <coughs> or, or during the days of the solitary island when importation of, of opium in its raw form became quite difficult due to the war. Um, in, in Midnight in Peking, you, you'll know that I talk about the badlands there. And, and the, uh, during the sort of uh, just, you know, late 1930s, um, various foreigners described the main drag through the, the badlands, the red light, the foreign red light district of, of Peking as heroin alley, which indicates that heroin was already there by that time. And there were signs of it in Shanghai as well. I was recently reading an article um, from 1940, and it was the last big seizure of illegal drugs in Shanghai by the Opium Suppression Board before the fall of Shanghai after in 1940, late 1941. And um, among that, as well as some raw heroin, was large amounts of, um, of, of manufactured, uh, some raw opium, sorry. There was large amounts of, of heroin and large amounts of stolen um, syringes that were um, stolen from hospital supplies and so on to supply um, addicts who, who were injecting. So, so the old notion, which is sort of described there, which could come from Fu Manchu or from Sax Roma of a classic kind of um, opium den in China or in you know, the Lower East Side of New York or Limehouse in London or wherever, is still there. But in there, of course, is this injection of heroin. I'm not quite sure about homemade hypodermics. You might have taken a little bit of an extra leap there, but um, certainly this was something that was going on in Shanghai at the time. And I think um, that it's little um, touches like that that make um, China Coaster a very, very um, good book worth reading. Um, so just to carry on a little bit, I mean, really after China Coaster, which by the way is published in 1951, um, there really isn't that much more covering Shanghai and China that's really worth reading or, or even published much after that. Um, I would note um, Steve Dodge, great name for a uh, pulp fiction writer, did a book called Shanghai Incident, um, and that was published in 1953. Um, but it's set in 1948, so it's set right on the cusp of um, the revolution. And Steve jo Dodge, who, whose real name was Stephen Becker, as you can see, he used it slightly later on in his career, um, uh, did also know Shanghai, but knew pre-war Shanghai. Um, and then did again visit Shanghai in about 1947, 1948 as a journalist. So although it's published in 1953, he does, he does capture much of that um, kind of world of interregnum uh, Shanghai, of rapid inflation, of everybody trying to get out, of everybody trying to make decisions, of the sense of this incredible sense of an end of an era and a new era beginning. China Coaster is more interesting from an interregnum point of view because we're two years into um, the People's Republic of China. And so, it, so it's, a, it's a sort of a useful document in terms of what's changing, what hasn't. Um, as the sort of 50s progress and then into the 60s and 70s, it's kind of um, that, that things are still, that China still pops up in pulp fiction a little bit. Hong Kong becomes more of a, a feature, Macau a little bit. Um, and many of them become kind of um, uh, more Cold War thrillers than the kind of um, pure pulps with just everybody bouncing around having fun. <coughs> I think eventually China, as it closed off more and as, as, as the time, as, as the years moved on away from people who sort of remembered going there or remembered that older pre-war Shanghai, um, audiences sort of lost people. New new locations came along that sort of enticed people. Um, <coughs> Cold War spy novels with the Soviets always worked well because, of course, you know, it, it, it's all white people and you can kind of have a, a trained American or, or Brit or whatever dropped into Moscow and sort of walk around in a way that they just couldn't really um, in, in Beijing or, or Shanghai at that time. Uh, Korea, of course, because of the war, becomes a feature. I mean, again, in um, in my book, Destination uh, Peking, I, I write a little bit about Harry Hervey, who was the actual original um, writer of um, Shanghai Express, the Marlena Dietrich film. But later on, he, he is trying to develop pulp fiction 
that is no longer about China because it's just closed off and it's it's very hard to place anyone there. And he starts writing a lot about Korea and around the Korea at the time of the start of the war, the Korean War. So again, you know, pure 50s sort of location. And they move on to other places. North Africa comes up a lot, Morocco, locations like that, the Caribbean and so on. Um, and so that's really uh, kind of um, the end of, um, of, uh, of pulp fiction and China. So I think almost, you know, I would say that um, China Coaster, if, if you're interested in that period, is worth a read. You can pick it up secondhand very cheaply, easy to get hold of. Um, and um, I think it's sort of um, an interesting read. I certainly get a lot from it. And, and the fact that he actually mentions real streets and real businesses, I think um, I find very useful when I'm writing to sort of think to myself, you know, how much am I making up here trying to do literary nonfiction and how much am I staying based in reality and, and coming across things like China Coaster as, as another kind of source to put against guidebooks and memoirs and newspaper articles and so on is, is, is sort of useful. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there. And if there's any, any questions, I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer them. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you so much, Paul. Actually, the questions are already coming in. I will also take the prerogative to ask a couple of my own questions, but I think uh, the one that came in from Kit is a, is a great start. So um, Kit is asking, are you interested in the pulp era of this era because it's a good read or because pulp is an accessible way to real history? Now, uh, at the same time as you're asked, answering this question, I would also like to ask you, what if somebody would actually like to read these novels, but you know, is not living close to a, a British secondhand bookstore. Is there any place where you can uh, read copies online? I I checked on Amazon, but I also I only saw secondhand uh, physical <coughs> copies of books. So both of these questions: where can we read them, and are you interested in them for the literary value, the thrill, or the historical value? Well, I think. Um... <clears throat> As to where you can get them, yes. I mean, obviously, if you don't have secondhand bookshops, it's quite hard. And and there's a, I mean, there are ways of finding things online. Of course, you know, one one thing that I would always say with these books is, you know, if you're uh, particularly sensitive about racial stereotypings or language and so on, they are products of their time, right? Like old movies, um, and and so um, you know, it's it's not that likely that anyone's going to reprint many of them. And mm -hmm. I'm always quite surprised nowadays when people reprint. Fu Manchu, which, which does happen. Sax Roma does get reprinted. Um, nobody reprints Mr. Moto. And again, I think that's a shame because I think he, he, that that is a brand that's been tarnished by very bad movies. Good books have been tarnished by very bad films. Um, Charlie Chan, again, is similar to that. And um, Yun Tae Huang, who wrote a great book about the original origins of Charlie Chan, which go back to a, a Hawaiian Chinese policeman, the old uh, Biggers New. Um, living in Hawaii, um, I think I think would argue that the books are still worth reading. And there, there's there's about half a dozen um, Charlie Chan books, and then the rest is all just sort of Hollywood makeup. Um, and uh, so 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 those films with their kind of silly portrayals and often actors in yellow face and so on rather rather obscure the original works. Um, where else can you get them? Well, so so that's what I mean. Is no no one's really um re reprinting them which it, which is a shame the only one who does get reprinted is l ron hubbard which you can get um all of his um as ebooks and and hard copy books because there's a whole industry of reprinting l ron hubbard for his followers <clears throat> no you don't have to be one of his followers to read these books these these books are these predate his scientology by by several decades um so uh, th so that's the answer to that. You've just got to kind of hunt around and, and look for them. Um, and then um, the other question is, why read them? Well, I, when you read, if you read genre, you're always going to read a lot of rubbish. But within it, there'll always be some really great stuff. So if you read crime, I read a lot of crime novels. Th there's an awful lot of trash in crime novels that, you know, I, I don't really like. But then, you know, you come across a Dashiell Hammett or a George Simenon or a Raymond Chandler or a James Elroy or, or a really great um, writer. But you sometimes have to wade through quite a lot of rubbish to get to get to the good writers, unless you've got very good people recommending you things. Mm. Um, 
and I think I feel pulp is like that as well. That it's kind of, you know, be, because it's called pulp because it was throwaway. It was in magazines that you bought and read on the train going to work, or these books were were cheap paperbacks that you shoved in your back pocket to read, largely from a kind of pre-television age, pre-internet age, obviously. Um, you know, they they were kind of churned out by the writers and read quickly by the readers and then disposed of. So um, it was it was a different sort of literature and, and it's pulp, not necessarily because the writing's rubbish, just because it's, you know, these are fast turnaround books. Mm. And they're interesting because they, they often react to events that take place. I, I mean, I was reading a very early pulp the other day that reacts to the Shanghai massacre of 1927. You know, other ones, including L. Ron Hubbard, react to the Japanese annexation of, of Manchuria. And in a sense, if you think about, you know, they often say that journalism is the, the first draft of history. It's almost like pulp is like the second draft of history, right? These guys are sitting around. They've got these stock stories of, you know, guy meets girl, girl cheats on him, meets another girl. There's some gangsters, the old Dashiell Hammett um, is it, is it no Chandler Chandler's line um, that, you know, you just keep writing and, and when you can't think where to go, have a man with a gun walk into the room. Right. It's ve it's very much right. written on that in that kind of style um, with some local flavor and some local detail um, thrown into it. I, I like them as well, because certainly the later pulps from the sort of mid 1930s onwards are also very noir. They're usually reasonably dark, you know, uh, men are men, women are women, gangsters are gangsters. Uh, there are psychopaths who kill without thinking. You know, the law is not very effective. Policemen are corrupt. You know, that, that kind of thing is in there as well. So, so there are many writers of, of, of pulp, and um, some of them are worth reading and some of them are not, and you probably will have to wade through quite a lot. If you then mm -hmm. slice pulp the way I have, later on from sort of being a kid and just buying old pulp magazines at, at sort of, you know, secondhand bookshops and, and just buying any book with an interesting cover. I mean, when I was, you know, if you see that China coaster cover, I mean, when I was, you know, 13, there's no way I wouldn't have bought that from a <laughs> shop, you know, for, for anything. So, I mean, you know, in the 1970s. Right. So, that, so, so that, that was kind of exciting. It's titillation as, as well. Mm. And then if you slice it the way that I've sliced it here, which is to say, well, I'm not, you know, I just want to read the pulps that talk about China to see what they teach me about China or, or who these people are who are writing them. And of course, they're often, as is true for all of pulp, journalists who have the ability to write fast and have a certain writing style um, and, you know, have knowledge of places. So, so they start to, you know, write about, places at times when they experience them that have all of this kind of background in so it's not an invaluable genre and of course there is a whole body of academic mm. study around it which maybe is going a bit far mm. but you know they, they, they certainly are worth reading and you certainly can get stuff from them and i think when when you sort of talk about when particularly if you're sitting in shanghai and you're thinking about what are the tropes of Shanghai modernity I've just it's nine it's this is 2022 obviously so it's sort of officially a um, hundred years of modernity right and a hundred years of modernism Ezra Pound said um, you know what is it uh, the modern world started in 1922 right and it's 1922 or around then when we start to see cinema really you know Hitchcock take off it's when we see Louis Armstrong and right. people in jazz it's when we see Scott Fitzgerald, Virginia Woolf, um, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, right? This is when we see modernity come in. And I'm talking about very high modernity there with Virginia Woolf and so on. But, you know, jazz and fashion and art deco architecture and hardly any city in the world embraces the mm. modern as much as Shanghai. And it's interesting that if we look at the first sort of int inclina intimations of art deco in Shanghai, the first studio movie in shanghai um and uh lucian of course the story of rq uh this is all 1922 so so we're at 100 years of modernity and um and pulp is one of the kind of 
mass disseminators of modernity for, for modernity and modernism to really become what it became it doesn't require everyone in the world to read ulysses right or or, or mrs dalloway it requires you uh, it, it also requires people to go to cinemas mm. right to to read pulp fiction um to 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 listen to the radio which is also mm. you know actually shanghai's first radio station is 1923 Right. right. So, right. so it, it, it fired these, these transmission belts of modernity and modernism mm -hmm. and awareness of the world and a modernity of the world and an ability to move around the world. This is the period of, you know, the ocean liner and, and the ability mm -hmm. to, to travel fast around the world, to, to have telephones in rooms, as well as, you know, <clears throat> central heating, air conditioning and all those things that make life more pleasant. Yeah. Um, this all happens, uh, um, you know, around uh, the pulps are one of the transmission belts of a sense of modernity and a mm. sense of the world um, to the average person who's got 25 cents to, to, to buy a book or a magazine. Right. Let me pick up on on pulp being the, the second draft of history and and uh, specifically the fact that uh, 50s fiction is, is is dealing a lot with the leftovers of the 40s, so it's um it's it's almost feels like there is a little bit of a bitter nostalgia about the world of of all these expats collapsing and and uh, uh, people trying to get uh, get out, uh, people still frequenting those places obviously because many of these writers didn't have access to China, physical access to China at the time. Also. Um, you can you can read about it in in, in first hand histories or biographies. For example, uh, in a biography of Maurice Cohen, who the the, the once bodyguard of Sun Yat-sen, is also a Canadian, just like Don Smith, uh, going back after forty nine and then uh, sitting around in in one of his favorite hotels. I I uh, it, it it wasn't the Peace Hotel. Um, and waiting for the old acquaintances to show up, and they never do so. Do you think that early 50s Shanghai was was really uh, kind of drenched in this kind of bitter nostalgia or it was just as people who were already not there or they didn't feel at home felt like? Yeah, that's a good question and a tough one because it obviously wasn't a universal feeling. There, there were people who felt they could hang on, right? There were people mm. who felt that they could do an accommodation <clears throat> with the communists. Um, and keep going. So even in 1951, you've got the North China Daily News still being published. You've got China Weekly Review uh, being published by, by J.B. Powell's son at that point. Um, and this later on gets him into all sorts of trouble with McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee and so on back in America. Um, on the other hand, you've got this large group of displaced persons who need to be who needs their situation resolved. Um, it's quite clear they're not going to be able to stay in China. They, they need to do this. And that process starts really in 1940, late 1945 and into 1946. And for many people, it's not, I wouldn't say an easy process, but it's not an overly complicated process. They apply to go somewhere, they, they, they want to go to America or, or they want a British passport or they've decided on somewhere else. Um, as I say, Brazil was another place that gave out a lot of passports um, that um, they, they are going. Right. So they are packing up and going. And if you look, for instance, at the, the, the sort of former Jewish ghetto at that time, there are sort of regular performances at the Broadway Theatre, which is just around just around the corner from Wayside and so on, um, of, you know, farewell events. Right. You know, fundraisers for those that are remaining and a sort of goodbye as another ship leaves another ship goes to san francisco another ship goes to sydney another ship you know heads off to, to to other locations taking people away all the time and this is true of the russians and it's true of the jewish refugees by sort of early 1950s you're really getting down to those people who are quite problematic to settle somewhere right and if anyone has listened to my podcast drama doc for the BBC Peking Noir, you'll know that there, you know, that eventually at the end, those last Russians that were left in around 1955 were gathered up 
No one would give them passports for one reason or another. They were gathered up, taken to Tianjin, and from Tianjin, they were taken to the Russian border and they were handed over to the Soviet Union. And what became of them, we don't know. We do know that some, some survived and married and lived on. We know others were, were shot at the border, apparently. So, so when was that, getting down. Uh, was, it, was it well into the 50s or even later? Yeah, I think, I think the last groups in Peking anyway, were, were rounded up and taken to Tianjin. I mean, literally were rounded up. No, no, they couldn't find anywhere else to go. And they were handed over to the Soviet Union in 1955. Remembering that was many that? of them were not people who'd ever been to the Soviet Union. Although the, the person I write about in Peking, I, I talk about in Peking that's, Noir that's was actually that, That's very yes, interesting. So, was was so there a legal, I mean, was it was it a, a written rule that there were no foreigners allowed in China at that time? Or it's just simply that they were personal non grata because they were not rich, they, they couldn't really look after themselves? Yeah, well, the, the latter, I think. Mm. So, so, of course, you know, some people were able to stay, those that joined the party, right? I mean, you know, and, and those people, the so-called right. round, right. eye, round eye gang that sort of were able to, to hang on. Mm. Um, but, you know, most didn't want to go. So, so by this point, and also, you know, you've still got some Chinese that are leaving, right? I mean, there's still people managing to leave to go to Hong Kong and, and elsewhere at this time. It's not a completely sealed down country. And of course, things don't always change. I mean, they do sometimes, but not always change overnight. So, you know, you, you, you can still find pictures like... Um, if you look at uh, Mikosha's pictures or other pictures from the interregnum period, you'll still find women in uh, chi pao, right? You'll still right. find women right. with, with their hair, long hair tied up in high heels and so on. You know, you'll still find adverts for cosmetics. You'll still find adverts for Hollywood movies, right? I mean, there's, there's still films coming in. Dist all distribution agreements haven't finished. There's a, there's a famous photo from, I think, 52 or 53 of a Clark Gable, Carol Lombard movie that's suddenly finally turned up and the cinemas are, are showing it. It's like a, about an eight-year-old movie by that time, right. but they're kind of showing it. So, so these things still exist and there's, there's still kind of bars and there's still kind of restaurants and there are clubs. I mean, they're, they're not in a great shape, right? They're, they're, not, they're not particularly glamorous. They're pretty scrappy on the clientele and so on but they're still kind of there. And so that, that process of shutting down somewhere takes time, right? You know, I mean, mm. it's just, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not as sophisticated as that, you know, that, that one day everyone's wearing a cheap hour and the next day they're all wearing a mouse suit. There is a right. process of easing people um, from one thing to another. And then at a certain point, pretty much all of the foreigners are gone. Pretty much all of the foreign businesses have either been, commandeered or taxed out of existence or have just decided not to bother and whose going's gone and and then you get into a kind of period there's then a kind of interesting thing that starts happening in chinese cinema because of course you know the other thing that's that's lost at this point is the tradition of the shanghai cinema studios but there are new studios of course pro pro government and they start producing large numbers of films and there are uh, flick books and cheap, cheap Chinese pulp novels being pushed out at this, uh, in the, by the sort of early mid 1950s. And the great theme is foreign spies in Shanghai. Hmm. Right? And that's a whole other subject because it's kind of all in the all in Chinese. But I yeah. mean, I have I saw a great presentation on this that, that, a, that an academic did. And there's all these 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 great movies where there's kind of Japanese stay behind spies and particularly Guomindang nationalist, you know, stay behind kind of operatives who are left there to disrupt and, and try and overthrow the government from within. And, 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 you know, so you start seeing all this kind of searching out for who these spies are. So, so there's a spy mania that takes place and occasionally a, a sort of a pompous foreigner will walk into those films or books. But of course, it really becomes very difficult for non-Chinese people to, to move around and mm. operate. So the, the fixation becomes, you know, okay, how many, Chiang Kai-shek's gone to Taiwan, how many people has he left behind pretending to be one thing or another, right. but engaged in all sorts of sabotage and so on. And this, and, and you know, that becomes a major sort of theme of Chinese pulp by mm. the mid-50s. Fantastic. 
Fantastic. Paul, the toughest thing about talking to you is stopping. Um, but and so there, there were a couple of questions. There was there was one question about about where uh, drugs that these people uh, took were produced. There is one question just coming in right now, but unfortunately, well, they, they our, were, our they event were, is. I, um, sorry, sorry, I can tell you they, they were produced in Hong Kong. Hong Kong had pill factories and heroin refining factories okay. that were run, and most of those had been set up by the Japanese during the war to kind of keep drugs flowing through China, you know, right. and, and, and everything. And they carried on. So, so it wasn't the Andrea was too. spot on. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That, that's exactly what the question was. That's exactly what the question was. Uh, I would I would like to, to, to slowly round up. Uh, there is one thing I would like to do. I'm, I'm sharing a link to China rhyming right here because um, it is basically the the, the, um, the blog version of what we are talking about here. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I mean, some people like to read rather than listen. Also, obviously, you can you can get some visuals out of it, you can get dates out of it. It also seems to me that that one of the commenters to to this blog entry is actually uh, Don Smith's relative, and then she adds a couple of um, intimate details about his life. Also, I am I am pasting this in because I assume that through your blog post people can reach out to you if they have questions that we didn't manage to, to address here. So of course, um, yeah, I'm always I, happy to hear from people. Did I leave anything out? I mean, is it people who are interested in the topic, people who would like to reach out to you, is there anything else that they must know at this point? No, my website's pretty good because um, it's got pretty much everything I'm doing. I'm doing a lot of radio work with the BBC around China at the moment, uh, Chinese history, and that's fun. I've got another uh hong kong shanghai thing coming up on rthk radio I, I kind of enjoy audio it's 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 very quick um but no i'll be uh yeah i i don't know what's happening this year but um yeah next year i start on a big thing which is i have a um a trilogy of um spy novels set in mm -hmm. shanghai during world war ii which are which are fictional but often based on a lot of real characters and real people so my publishers decided that they like they like the first one. So um, yeah, so I'm I'm going ahead Sounds with like those, works. which I think uh, yeah, or again another way of kind of espionage literature is another way of trying to look at Shanghai and all the various groups that are in Shanghai and all the various intelligence organizations that were working in Shanghai, as well as obviously what's going on with the Chinese themselves and the Japanese, but also right. British intelligence, French intelligence, the Russians. Oh, just just everyone operating. Exactly. So I want to, um, yeah, I wanted to talk a lot about that. Um, yeah. So I thought fiction and spy novels would be the excellent. sort of fun way to do that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so please, yes, everybody, please, please do follow uh, Paul on China Rhyming. Also, in pretty much any social media that you use, you can follow him on Amazon. You can you can find some of the books, the audio books. I I, I personally love because. Um, they they really they really surround you uh, with the time. I also um, share here my email address in 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 case you have any problem reaching out to Paul or you have questions that you would like to ask um, the Royal Asiatic Society China, then you can find me here and I will get back to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Once again, I think uh, now it's an annual tradition to have you at the History Club, and I, I really, really hope that we can continue this, and I cannot even imagine what your next project is going to be, but we will follow you. And um, yeah, cheers from Shanghai. We hope that you will be able to get back here soon. Yeah, great. I should mention, by the way, that this, this piece of work came out of an article for the RAS Journal, and I've, I've been sort of so delighted over the years to see that the journal's been maintained and kept going and it keeps getting sort of great articles in it. And everything. we are very stubborn about it. Melinda yes. up in Beijing has taken on the editorship now. And um, I mean, I really think that uh, everyone should be pushing and talking about the journal a lot because it is a, it's a really fascinating journal that has lots of good work on so many aspects of China, China history, poetry, literature, society. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Um... Most people on this call are, are members, so if you haven't picked up your free copy of the journal, then reach out to us and, and we will try to make sure to, uh, um, to make it happen. Our, um, mostly we can do it in our reading room right now, and if you are not a member and you would like a copy of um, our journal, which looks something like this, full of 
all kinds of articles about China, Asia, history, art, urbanism, and more, then please do drop me an email and I would be very happy to uh, help you get a copy.